This is my first video update coming to you from Nicosia, Cyprus on this Monday morning. Let's talk about some news. And so we have the uh, conclusion of the World Cup in Qatar. Congratulations to Argentina. A well-deserved uh, win in, uh, in Qatar at the World Cup. And because we have the... Uh, the end of the World Cup in Qatar, I thought it would be a good time to do an update on what has been dubbed Qatar Gate. Now, I reported on this story about, I want to say two weeks ago, where you had a member of the uh, European Parliament, actually one of 14 vice presidents of the European Parliament, did you know that the EU Parliament had 14 vice presidents? I had no idea. But, um, one of the, uh, the vice presidents of the EU Parliament, Eva Kaili, who was at one point in time a Greek news anchor, she, uh, she got busted, allegedly, for, uh, for money laundering and taking bribes from Qatari officials so that she could uh, talk up how uh, how great Qatar is and she would vote against any EU parliament uh, resolutions which uh, which called out Qatar's alleged human rights abuses during the run up to to the World Cup and actually during the World Cup as well so the EU parliament would come out with all kinds of uh, resolutions saying that Qatar is abusing these people and this group and that group and you know it's it's disgraceful that we've allowed Qatar to host the World Cup and stuff like that. Typical EU Parliament uh, stuff that they like to uh, to virtue signal about their human rights and their EU values, and they like to lecture the whole world about these things. Anyway, the claim was that uh, Eva Kaili she uh, she took something like six hundred thousand euros from uh, Qatari officials. That's what the allegations are. Uh, that uh, she took this money and for this money she was going to uh, to talk up how great Qatar is and to not to not vote in favor of these resolutions anyway um, what has happened since this story broke well uh, Eva Kylie she has been arrested by Brussels police I believe she is now in uh, in a woman's prison in uh, Belgium in Brussels and she's being held there awaiting I guess awaiting some sort of trial or I don't even know what, what, what happens next with her. But uh, she's in this prison and uh, there's this whole big European investigation as to how, how could this corruption have happened. And you're getting stories as to, uh, as to what this whole sting operation was all about in busting Eva Kylie, And it turned out to be not only Eva Kylie but a bunch of other... Uh, EU, EU uh, officials and think tanks and NGOs connected to the European Union, and um, and uh, Eva Kylie's uh, father was involved, and I think they even say that her her sister and her husband, all, all these people were were involved in this big operation of getting money from Qatar and and uh, doing favors for Qatar in exchange for, for this money. I don't even know if, uh, if they've actually called out Qatar, to be quite honest, in the uh, allegations from the Belgian police. Everyone knows it's Qatar, but I don't, I don't know yet if the actual charges have pointed to Qatar. The last I read, they say it's a Middle East country that was uh, bribing this European MP. And, uh, and so... The, the story goes that, uh, that the Belgian police, they busted not Eva Kylie with the money, but they busted her father taking the money from, uh, from the hotel to the airport. There was some sort of panic with, uh, with this European MP with regards to this money and the Belgian police, and I'm just summarizing it, the Belgian police, they couldn't actually go into her house and seize this money because she has immunity. And so they waited for this money to get passed off to her uh, father. And then her father got busted 
at the hotel, and that's when this whole sting unraveled. That's what the Belgian police is saying, and uh, that's the story from uh, from their side of things. Eva Kylie, she is saying that she had nothing to do with this money, and uh, her lawyer was actually speaking on Greek TV all last week, and uh, he said that she has nothing to do with this money. This this money was actually um, something that her husband was. Uh, was working on was involved in and she was like get this money out of my apartment i don't want anything to do with this money whatever it's about and then she called her father to get this money out of her out of her vicinity so to speak like six hundred thousand in cash or something like that and uh, that's when they busted her father and uh this is some this was some uh, some dealings that her husband had, and now they're trying to to pin all the blame on her. But the interesting part about this is that she's actually saying that uh, the corruption with regards to Qatar is actually happening at the level of Joseph Borrell and not at her level. She's actually saying that uh, that the real kingpins the real mafia bosses of all this corruption and all of these favors for uh, this Middle East country is uh, actually coming from the Asif of Joseph Burrell and he's he's trying to put the blame on Eva Kylie because she has the goods on Burrell and now they're trying to uh, to throw her under the bus and pin it all on her um, that's pretty much the story so I mean the corruption in in the European Parliament is absolutely in the EU is is off the charts, and the EU Parliament and they're now uh, they're they're putting forth resolutions to uh, to suspend any Qatari representatives from uh, EU from the EU uh, HQ, so no Qataris from uh, from the government can actually visit the EU headquarters. I'm sure the Qataris are uh, are really upset about that, and uh, and the EU is absolutely appalled at at this corruption, and they denounce Qatar's alleged attempts to influence members and former members and staff and staff of the European uh, Parliament through acts of corruption, which constitute serious foreign interference in the EU's democratic processes. <laughs> It's key to ensure that democratic processes are not captured by private and external interests. This is the EU's denunciation of Qatari uh, influence in the European Union, because it's only the Qataris that influence, that influence the European Union. It's only those guys that are buying, uh, that are uh, paying for favors from the EU. God forbid they should ever do an investigation on, uh, on how many EU parliament members are influenced by the uh, Soros group, by Soros and his group of NGOs and think tanks. We wouldn't want to do an investigation there, would we? <laughs> or maybe an investigation on uh, on how many EU uh, parliament members and high up EU officials are influenced by, I don't know, say, uh, Elensky, Ukraine, say, Big Pharma. <laughs> it's, no, it's all Qatar. <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway, she says she has the goods on Burrell. They're trying to shut her up. The, uh, the Belgian police, they have her arrested. In Greece, everyone is going crazy. The political parties in Greece are, are pulling their hair over this incident. They actually call it Qatargate. That's what they call it. It's Qatargate. And um, some people are saying this shows the corruption of uh, Eva Kaili's party, which is the uh, socialist. It's the Basok party, but uh, they're... They're a neoliberal socialist uh, party, and they're saying this shows the corruption in her party. The Basok party is saying, no, Eva Kaili was actually, she was acting on behalf of the ruling party, the New Democracy Party, and the New Democracy, the, the, the New Democracy Party is, is um, a, neo, a neoliberal globalist. They say they're conservative. I don't think they're conservative, but anyway, they brand themselves as conservative. So they're a neoliberal conservative. And uh, they're duking it out with the neoliberal globalist socialists, two globalist parties. But uh, they're now, you know, trying to say uh, they're trying to point fingers at each other and say that this MEP was actually working for for the one party. You know, she was working for the other. And there's all kinds of political fallout from this. 
I've gotten a lot of uh, emails and messages from uh, from people I know in Greece who are uh, really following this story closely. And uh, some of the people say this is corruption at the EU level, okay, nothing more, nothing less. Other people are saying that she's she's being wrongly accused and she does have the goods on Burrell and they're just trying to scapegoat her. But uh, other people in uh, Greece are saying that this is this is actually uh, much more to do with with infighting between Greek political parties because some ana- some analysis is saying that what happened is that the Basok party, which is the globalist socialist left party, they were uh, running stories about how the ruling government party, the uh, Mitsotakis globalist neoliberal right party, how the Mitsotakis government was spying on uh, on uh, government officials and prominent Greeks over the past couple of years. They were using software to spy on them. And this was a big scandal in Greece. And so what the Mitsotakis government did, the government that was being accused of spying from the opposition party, what they did is that they got, uh, they ratted out the uh, European parliament member who's aligned with the party that was, uh, that was saying that the ruling Mitsotakis party was spying on government officials. So, so this is all just, you know, one rat ratting out the other rat. And so the ruling party, the Mitsotakis party, some analysts are saying that what they did is they called up uh, Vander Crazy and they said, look, we have some information that uh, this Basok, this socialist, neoliberal Basok MEP, in, uh, in the EU that she's taken bribes from uh, a Middle Eastern government. So you guys might want to investigate it. And so, you know, this is like just good old, good old uh, fashion political uh, mudslinging and, and rivalry. And the one party is saying you're spying on Greeks using the software. So the ruling party said, OK, two can play at that game. And we're going to rat out your European parliament member. Anyway, that is the latest update with this story, which has been dubbed Qatar Gate. <laughs> Qatar Gate, uh, EU corruption. There's this meme going around with an iceberg and it has uh, Eva Kylie, and she's like the, the iceberg that's above water. And then it has underneath it, it says like European Union, uh, van der Leyen's corruption. <laughs> and it's like all the iceberg that's underneath the, uh, the water. I'll, I'll, I'll put a screenshot of this meme if I could find it. I think it sums it up perfectly as to uh, to what's really going on in the EU. Anyway, uh, let's get uh, let's get moving now to Eletsky and uh, his interview with the French broadcaster TF1. This was my clown world yesterday because it was this interview with TF1 where Eletsky said that uh, he challenges Putin to a fight. You know, mano a mano, one on one, him and Putin can duke it out. And Alensky said uh, Putin wouldn't be man enough to meet him uh, on the streets, in the alley for a fight. He wouldn't be man enough, according to to Alensky. The the actor, the comedian actor, is uh, is calling out the judo master for a one on one fight. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, during this interview, when. Uh, when Alensky was making these comments about fighting Putin, he actually talked about Crimea as well. And uh, I really think that during this interview, Alensky was doing the, uh, the you know what stuff a little too much because if you thought his, his comment about, uh, about fighting Putin was crazy, well then, just, uh, just wait. I'm going to read you what he said about Crimea. So this is what Alensky said with regards to Crimea. He said, Ukrainians are now psychologically ready to take the Crimean Peninsula from Russia by force. Alensky told French broadcaster TF1 in an interview on Sunday, the reconquest that's in quotes of Crimea has supposedly already started in Ukrainians' heads, the president claimed hinting that he could visit the deoccupied peninsula as early as 2023. The operation itself has not started yet, Elensky said, when asked about Kiev's plans for Crimea. When it starts, you will definitely hear about it, he told TF1, adding that 
He personally believes the conquest of Crimea has started in people's heads, and that's very important. That is a quote. The reconquest of Crimea has started in people's heads, and that's very important. Okay, uh, according to... <laughs> Let, let me continue. According to Olensky, it was not enough for Kiev to just repeatedly state that the peninsula is a part of Ukrainian territory. Ukraine should be ready to retake it by force, he said, adding that Russia would hardly give up on it. One should be ready to go to Crimea, Olensky said. No one would just surrender Crimea for no particular reason. Reconquest already starts with society, with its will and readiness. I believe the start has been made, Olensky said. Now, Olensky, he didn't provide any details about how Ukraine is going to take Crimea or when they're planning to take Crimea. But he did say that he loves Crimea and he said he would be glad to come to our deoccupied Crimea. That is what he said. And he said uh, it would be nice to visit Crimea. He used the word nice in uh, the summer of 2023. So those were uh, Olensky's comments with, uh, with regards to Crimea. He said, uh, it is now uh, in people's, people's heads. People are psychologically ready to uh, take Crimea by force. The reconquest of Crimea has started in people's heads. So that's going to make it true, according to Olensky. This is like that book. It reminds me of that book that, that, that came out, what was it, like 20 years ago, called The, uh, the Secrets where they kind of tell you to just, if you say something enough times and visualize it and you say it enough times, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to come true. But I guess, I guess these are the, uh, the techniques that, that Alensky is uh, implementing here, <laughs> right? If, if we believe it, then it's, then it's going to happen. I mean, okay, uh, you know, it's in my head right now. I mean, I'm, I'm convinced it's in my head right now that when I walk over to the bank right there across the street, they're going to give me 50 million euros. You know, it's, I'm convinced it's, it's in my head right now that, that that's going to happen. Doesn't mean it's going to happen. <laughs> no matter how many times I say it, I really doubt that, uh, <laughs> that I'm going to walk over to the bank and they're going to hand me a suitcase of 50 million uh, euros. But, uh, you know, hey, it's always nice to, uh, to fantasize about these things, I guess. But, um, all joking aside, it's this is, yeah. There's there's going to be no uh, there's going to be no peace. There can be no peace. There can be no negotiations. The minute you have Crimea, you put Crimea on the uh, on the table. This type of rhetoric is is tabled, and you're saying, you know, this doesn't end until we take Crimea. It just basically means that this is not going to end. That's all they're, they're saying. Whenever they throw in the word Crimea in any type of talk about negotiations or peace or anything like that, or when is this conflict going to end? And the minute they say this conflict ends when we, when we retake Crimea, when the reconquest, using Alensky's words, with the reconquest of Crimea, then you understand that this conflict has, has no end in sight. It's going to end by, by force. That's exactly where we're heading. And so uh, Alensky's handlers, they've told him, they've ordered him to, uh, to continue, to continue to send troops into Bakhmut, to continue to, uh, to fight this war and to not negotiate with Russia. Not that that uh, negotiation at this point in time is even possible, but um, yeah, this is, this is where we're heading towards. Uh, there's going to have, there's going to be a military solution to this. Uh, that's obvious. And uh, and yesterday we actually had some big news. Now that I think about it, uh, Marinka, the town of Marinka, from what I understand, is uh, now under Russian control. This is important because Marinka was one of the towns that was being used to shell Donetsk city. So the fact that the Russians now have Marinka is uh is a relief for the people of donetsk city but it also means that the russians can now move to retake the other fortified areas which are shelling donetsk city so now they're in a very good position to uh to retake the other towns the other fortified very heavily fortified uh 
towns in uh, Donetsk that are being used by the Ukraine military to shell Donetsk city. So this was a big deal, the fact that Marinka is uh, now in the control of the Russian military. And just this morning, we had uh, more drone strikes in uh, Ukraine. From what I understand, they hit uh, Kiev really, really hard. Um, power plants in Kiev. And there's videos of uh, a fire at, uh, in the areas of these power plants. More blackouts at these uh, in, uh, in Kiev as well. And just, uh, just a terrible situation for, uh, for Kiev. And once again, it shows that uh, there is no, no answer to Russia's combination of missiles and get on to drones. And I'm looking at the videos right now of firefighters trying to put out the, uh, the fire at these uh, facilities in, uh, in Kiev. And there's a Ukrainian, uh, there's a state of emergency, I believe, that is, has been called in Kiev as well. So they have no answer to this, um, to these missiles and drone strikes. So a couple, a couple of more of these, two, three, four weeks more of this, and, and that's it. I mean, Ukraine's entire uh, system is going to collapse. And then, then you get the refugee situation, which we've been talking about on this channel for two months now. You're going to get the refugee situation in Europe, and you know it's just a domino effect of, of chaos. And that's probably when Russia's going to make their big move. When the lights go out, when you have this, uh, this big refugee crisis, and uh, the, the Ukraine military has been, has been annihilated in Bakhmut, when all these things happen, that is when I think, in my opinion, and I could be wrong about this, that's when Russia is going to make their, uh, their big move. And, and I think it's going, to, it's going to coincide with, uh, with the hardening of the ground and certain weather conditions as well. So I think this is this being timed to happen when all of these things kind of align. That's just my, my view of it, but this is where we're heading towards. Anyway, uh, since we were talking about Alensky and his crazy comments, which are probably influenced by his, you know what, <laughs> by his favorite hobby. Oh, by the way, there's an interesting article on the AP. I just want to point this out before I get to my clown world of, uh, of, women, of women soldiers in Ukraine. And this is an interesting revelation. So the Associated Press, they read an article called Homegrown Supply Operation Outfits Women Soldiers. And in this uh, article, they, were, they, they put out this article to talk up how, how there's, uh, there's women now fighting on the front lines and they're, they're in the military right now because, you know, all of Ukraine is united to fight the Russians. That's the impression that they wanted to give. And so they're, they're talking about how there's so many women that are volunteering that they don't have the the outfits, the gear, the kit to to supply them. Also, you know, they're they're working overtime. The factories, uh, the outfitters of these of, of these kits, they're working overtime to get it to to the women fighters, to the women soldiers. But the interesting revelation of this of this piece from the Associated Press is the admission, according to them, according to the Associated Press, that fifty seven thousand women are in the Ukraine military right now. Let me read you what they say. A volunteer group called Zem Zemlachki, roughly translated as women compatriots, is serving many of the 57,000 women in the Ukrainian military with boots, uniforms, and stand to pee tubes, wireless bras, thermal underwear, medicines, right size bulletproof plates for their flak jackets, and care packages with items like lotions, shampoo, toothpaste, and feminine hygiene products. In short, the group fills unanticipated gaps in the, in the Ukraine military's own supply operation. And then the AP says that today, at least 6,000 Ukrainian women have been, have been deployed on or near the front lines in roles like paramedics and intelligence officers, but also snipers and artillery gunners. They have joined the fight in a country where all men aged 18 to 60, with some exceptions, have been barred from leaving under martial law enacted after Russia's invasion. So a very interesting admission from the Associated Press, 57,000 women 
in the Ukraine military, of which they say 6,000 have been deployed on or near the front lines. Very interesting admission there. So, uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's do a clown world. And we were talking about Alensky and his favorite hobby. Well, it looks like his hobby is uh, also one of the favorite hobbies among the uh, UK political elite. And The Guardian is reporting that traces of a suspected Class A drug were found at a government grace and favor home after parties attended by political allies of Liz Truss. The Guardian has been told the white powder was discovered at the Chevening estate last summer in the days before Truss won the Tory leadership contest and became prime minister, according to sources. The Guardian says an insider said cocaine was widely used across Whitehall and, parliament and parliamentary estate and the parliamentary estate and claimed that some of Truss's political allies used it. There is no suggestion that Truss or Johnson themselves used that drug or that they would have been aware if drugs were used or present. The Guardian has not been told who was responsible for the alleged deposits of white powder. So basically, you had a bunch of, uh, of political elites hanging out at this estate. Maybe Liz Truss was there, maybe she wasn't. Maybe Boris Johnson was there, maybe he wasn't, but they were all you know, uh, enjoying the, uh, what's that song? The white, the white horse. <laughs> they were all riding the white horse as that uh, classic rock song goes. So yeah, I wonder what Boris was doing when he was visiting Alensky in Kiev. <laughs> anyway, that's the cloud world. That's coming from The Guardian, by the way, as well. And of course, they're not naming names. Of course they're not. But uh, yeah, this is... Uh, I guess this is the deep state using the Guardian to say to the political class in the UK, don't uh, don't anybody in uh, in the political class of the UK get any any strange ideas as far as uh, stopping aid to Ukraine or or straying away from from the party line because you know we've got we've got the the photos we've got some good evidence on you guys and, and what you've been up to at your parties. Uh, anyway, that's the video, everybody. TheDuran.Locals.com. We are also on Rockfin. The Duran Shop. There we go. 10% off. Use the code. Good day. I am signing out from Nicosia, Cyprus. Take care.